Welcome to the Addiction Solution Podcast. I'm Michelle Dunbar. Enjoy listening and watching as addiction experts Mark Sheeran and I cover controversial as well as helpful topics on addiction, how to move past it, and other related subjects. As two of the co-founders of the Freedom Model, Mark and I will give you a completely new perspective on the topics that matter to you. We will take to task the Recovery Society's lies and misinformation and replace them with facts, research, and the methods to move on from addiction struggles without 12-step meetings, rehabs, and the shackles of endless recovery. Let's escape the treatment and recovery trap together and learn to be free. Welcome to the truth. Hey, everyone. Hey, here we are again for another edition of the Addiction Solution Podcast. We're back. <laughs> so this week. And, and very, hang on. I, I even have my little freedom model. Oh, cup. look, it's a little. I, I, <laughs> let me, everything's reflecting here. <clears throat> so I just want to remind you that this is going to be released next week because right now we're in like the third or week of March. And next week is the last week of March. So Friday, when this is released, so this coming Friday, April 1st, you will be able to enroll in Freedom Model International, Yeah, which we keep talking about. It's a wonderful way where you can get access to the (laughs) online program for as long as you want at a much lower cost. And also have uh, other benefits that we're going to provide in Freedom Model International. And what we're really doing is providing you ongoing information, education, and yes, support as you deprogram from the addiction disease paradigm. Not only that, but uh, we just decided yesterday that, uh, and this hasn't even been released to the public, the entire Freedom Model online program for the family. Yes, that is, we are working on right now is also going to be included in your membership. So you'll get uh you'll get the entire online program for the substance user, you'll get the entire online program for the family, and you'll get uh a newsletter every month, you'll get four new lessons every month, you'll get a 2-hour question and answer session, private confidential with Michelle and I. Just and for a, members only. Yep. Yep, and that's in webinar form, you know, there'll be people submitting their questions and we'll answer them directly for, for two hours a month. Yep. Um, <clears throat> so, and more than that, it's, it's really about staying connected to freedom and understanding and reinforcing this idea that you're a free person. And, uh, and, and as the recovery society sort of b- continues to bombard you with this sort of victim mentality that our culture has, has that's She's taken embraced. Yeah. Embraced. That's, <clears throat> that's a good way of saying it. Um, you don't have to go back into that sort of model. You know, That's right. you, you don't have to feel a lack of confidence in your newfound freedom. We're going to help you move forward. Yeah. And so, you know, with that, what we're going to talk about in this episode of the podcast is over complicating addiction. I had a question that somebody, somebody private messaged me um, that's, that's been reading our book. And he asked the question about, um, this author, this author that is, uh, and I'm not going to mention her because I haven't read her book yet. Um, but, but you know, he, she was talking about basically getting sober without AA and running the alcohol experiment, which just say in her book was only released last year or the year before. And we talk about that exact thing in the freedom (laughs) model. So about running the experiment, um, of going abstinent for a period of time. And he was like, you know, I just don't know if I should do, apparently she has some kind of program online. And, um, and with a cursory look, she does what a lot of people do that are non AA, you know, they're like, okay, I'm out of AA. I'm not doing AA, which is a positive move in a positive direction. But then they attribute their addiction to something else. And, a so, lot, something other than their mind. Something other than their own mind. So they they kind of walk that. It's a terrible place to be. Actually, you're you're you still have a belief system that you're powerless on some level. You still have a belief system that you know you're that that alcohol or drugs are inherently addicting, um, and that you are somehow powerless to their to their power. Well, here's here's an interesting thing. So. 
why do we why do we overcomplicate it? There's a whole number of reasons why we do this. One is the money made in treatment oh, promotes yeah, for that. Sure. But let's get away from that for a minute. Let's say, you know, usually a money drive needs some sort of plausible reason to buy, right? So the treatment industry needs customers, needs people that believe that it's a complex problem and mm. that they need treatment. Now, substance use is a funny thing. I, I had a student yesterday and we were going through chapter 10, eight through 10, which talks about the identity, the addict and alcoholic identity. And they said, how did I become sort of a fixed mindset on this one issue? Right. How I may be like totally growth mindset in every other way. Yeah. But with addiction, I have this belief system. So I said, well, it's interesting you asked that. First of all, the, the answer is we've overcomplicated the problem to such a degree that you can't see the truth. But the other thing is there's an active placebo effect, effect at play. And that is substances are different than a lot of quote unquote addictions, right? Things that we, we uh, do a lot of. For instance, you could, you could be a race car driver. And you could say it becomes an obsession to the guy that's racing or the gal sure. that's racing. And they put everything into it. It's very risky. It's dangerous. It has all the same earmarks as an addiction with a drug, right? And they even use words like addiction and obsession and compulsion. I get in the car and I'm compelled and all else kind of stuff. But it, but it never goes into the realm of disease or disorder or this weird place that drugs do. And people don't feel powerless to get in the car. Right. So the question is, why with a drug do we feel this way? And the, and the answer is because the active placebo is when you put it in your body, you internalize it and you have an, an internal physical reaction. You're not going to get that driving a race car. You might get thrilled and things like that, but you're not, the car doesn't go inside of you and give you an active placebo effect. Right. Okay. So that active placebo is easily misinterpreted in the mind as magical as we only we, if no wait just a minute only if you find it pleasurable that's right that's right it's only, very subjective yes so let's say you're the one one in two two out of ten people that over the long haul in the population find it to be fun and exciting yep. and pleasurable um what happens is you have the 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 sensation in your body then you have the recovery society saying that is now a mental, medicinal, mystical experience. Right. That's where it gets fortified. So you take something that could be as simple as a sugar high, right? Or some other physical pleasure, and then you amplify it into some sort of need for human emotional and mental problems. So that's where things get real crazy. That's why we build such a massive value in it. Yes. In the experience. And that's it. Once you get to that level of need. Now, the way some of these non 12 step neuroscientist people are now explaining it, they start to go down this rabbit hole of neurochemicals, right? Your right. brain chemicals right. and specifically dopamine. Um, and so I had the question I was posed to me that, well, according to this scientist, alcohol releases dopamines in the brains, which is what makes it addictive. And my answer is let's, let's walk it back and simplify it a little bit. If alcohol was inherently addictive, then every single person that ingested it would become addicted. Correct? Right. If it was a matter of pharmacology, because the pharmacology is very, very measurable and reliable. Absolutely. We're talking about molecules doing certain things in the body tissue. Absolutely. But, but to your point, most people don't find it pleasurable. So where is pleasure found? See, right. That, this is where this is where it's so frustrating for me because most people think they start talking about dopamine. Dopamine is is a, is a physical effect. Yes. But you need in the mind to interpret that as pleasurable. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what I said. I said, well, do, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, and based on the research I've done, um, or read dopamine is released when we find anything pleasurable, any activity pleasurable. And, and it's now there are probably people that have higher levels of dopamine and low, whatever. Um, but 
when you interpret something as pleasurable, it naturally re releases these pleasure chemicals in our brain. So here's, here's, so where does pleasure emanate from is your interpretation of an experience, whether that experience is in your body, whether that experience is outside of you, it's something you're observing. The right. point is you need a mind, a thought based thing to interpret what you feel is valuable about the experience to begin with in order for dopamine to even be released. Exactly. And we, we talk about this in chapter 20. So this is something if you're going down that rabbit hole of the research and then you see the pretty brain scans and you see all of these things, read chapter 20 in the freedom model, because here's the thing about pleasure. There is not, not a single experience that's inherently pleasurable to all people at all times. That's right. Not one. I mean, that's right. It, it depends on your set and setting have a whole lot to do with it. It has everything to do with your mind. <laughs> yes. And, <laughs> and how you're going to interpret something. And so, you know, I'm not going to go down that. Now, the reason people, if you're somebody and you're like, it can't be that simple. It can't be as simple as I have a choice yeah. and I interpret things and look at habits are what they are and they can be really difficult to break. And our belief systems are really a lot of times what keeps us stuck. And so if you're going down the rabbit hole, know what you're doing. What you're doing is you're looking for it. Not, you're not looking for a solution. You're looking for validation of why you're struggling. You're looking for validation of why you can't stop. Um, and and so, so sometimes you just have to simplify things and realize all of that research, all of the brain scans, and we talk about this in the loss of control appendix, appendix and, A. And appendix B, which we debunk the brain scans. Exactly. Yeah, you might want to read that. That's, yep. That's huge. People stop. Most just go back to that whole... The research shows, and it's very consistent, that nearly everyone gets over an addiction. And you know what? People stop when their brain is most, when that brain scan shows they're most addicted. That's when everybody stops. Yeah, this is an interesting thing. So they did a study, many studies actually, with methamphetamine users, drinkers, all kinds of people. And so they took a population of people, and then they said, well, now stop. And they stopped. Yes. So they could get... Uh, uh, brain scans with them actively using, then brain scans with them uh, after they stopped. And now the theory of their uh, study, the hypothesis, what they've proven supposedly, is that when your brain is changed, you, you are compelled to use beyond your will. You can't stop. So that's the idea. But then in the study, every single study subject had stopped using. Yes. And nobody seemed to notice this. But right. That, that, how that did the, they stop? The very study that was supposed to prove that a, a changed brain compels you to use beyond your will and you can't stop, every single person had stopped. That's right. So, so at the height of brain change, everybody in the study had stopped. Now, I can't overemphasize that. I, I, I'm going to say it like three different times because – because the study to prove that compelled use is real proved that it isn't. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> right. So, so now let's go back to the whole idea that, you know, that there's, there's chemicals, right? The chemicals in our brain. Well, just about every study shows that chemicals in our brain are released based on our thoughts, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Not vice versa. So you have a thought in your mind. And then it releases a chemical in your brain. So, so, but where does that thought come from? You. Yeah. You are your thoughts. You, <laughs> you. So you're, 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 you are your beliefs. That's right. And, and so, so these, we build these habits. Okay. When so there was, we, there was a troll in one of the groups and, and we call them trolls. You know, he was an AA guy who came in to kind of, throw it was in the, one of the leaving AA groups because he wanted to kind of throw it out there that well how do you explain this and he said you know basically was using that trauma causes addiction and he's like oh people 
he goes, well, how do you explain, you know, addictions usually addictions start because somebody is traumatized and, or somebody is experiencing depression or negative thoughts. And I'm like, that's not true. That's not true. If you, it, now that's the accepted narrative, right? That's the accepted, but, but if that were true, then every single human being would be compelled to use. <laughs> right. It's like when they say, you know, depression causes uh, substance use or poverty causes substance use or whatever it might be, you know, uh, being abused. The problem is, is that most people that are abused, that are in poverty, that have all these traumas, they don't use drugs. They don't. So, or, or alcohol. So the majority don't. So you can't just ignore that. You can't just throw out the, the, the people that don't fit the narrative and it's, it's the vast majority. Right. So even people with um, mental illnesses, 80% of them don't have a drug or alcohol problem. Nope. So, so how do we just ignore that? We've been ignoring that for 50 years of research, but there luckily there are enough studies out there where people didn't ignore it. And, and it shows that, most people don't find this stuff pleasurable. They don't choose it. They don't build habits around it and they don't interpret it the way uh, other people do. So, yeah. so it's important to get back to reality. Okay. And the reality is nobody gets addicted to something they don't like. And most people's first experiences with substances are, are experimentation in their teen years or just in a party, or it's something that you either, I mean, there are a whole lot of people I mean, I tried, um, you know, amphetamines and I never liked them. And I was somebody that got, seemed to get addicted to everything I tried, not amphetamines, right. not cigarettes, right. um, the most addicting thing on the planet. So uh, I just didn't find them as pleasurable as I did other things. So, so it's really important to understand that choice, the, I, the free will wipes away, negates all of this overcomplicated gobbledygook, neuroscience stuff, right? You know, you have the ability to reason and you reason your way to heavy substance use and you develop a habit with it because you believe it works for this and that and the other thing. You believe it's your, your best chance to feel better or to be happier, but you can change that belief, which is amazing. Now, if you don't believe what Michelle just said, what it tells you and tells us is that you have mythology or ideas that are not rooted in fact. So yeah. you have some logical errors that are making you blind to the simple reality that we build value in our experiences with our own mind. And, and we do that with everything. You yeah. know, if you didn't have thoughts or a mind at work, uh, you wouldn't exist. You, your body would simply go limp and you would not exist, right? You'd be brain dead. You'd be mind dead. Um, so what you think is crucial and what you believe about a substance is crucial for you to get over the problem. If you believe that the drug pharmacologically drives your behavior, that's backwards. So if you believe that a drug enters your body, it changes the biochemistry of your brain tissue, therefore your mood and your thoughts are altered and that it controls the narrative you're in trouble because that's yeah. just not reality now. And there's no way out of that. That's right. Now the drug does pharmacologically do something. So I, I, it drives me crazy when people say, oh, so you're saying the drug doesn't, doesn't do, anything. do anything. Right. I, I, look at, I've overdosed. She's overdosed. I, I think we know what a drug can do. Um, and, and it's, it's actually quite reliable. If you get good at drinking and drugging, you know, your limits, you can, yep. you, you know, you, you know, the game. Um, so yes, it does something to the body, but it doesn't control our mind or force us into a pleasure zone. No, it doesn't do that. It doesn't have any capacity to do that. Um, only if we interpret the physical sensation as pleasurable, will you have the dopamine drop or increase? I'm sorry. So, so that's, that's how that works. Yeah. And there are days when you interpret the same substance that you've always used, you have fun with it. You interpret it as pleasurables and there are days that you don't. And there's even times, let's say that you're a daily drinker where every day you get tired of it. Yes. Yes. You, you probably feel good. It, it, when you get the online program, if you join the membership and you get the online program, we have 
a lesson called the binge construct mm. where, you know, yeah. you, it asks you to go through your typical drinking binge and or drugging binge or drugging binge. And, you know, what there, sometimes it's only the first little bit that you find pleasurable and then you move past it because you're seeking something. You feel like you're going to be happier with the with drinks four and five or hits four and five or going into day six or whatever it is. But yeah. I mean, a lot of times you even have a, a fantasy about the drug that that came from teen years or the 20s where where it was a lot of fun, where it was a where where you're allowed to live in mythology. Let me explain this. When you're young and you have your first love, if that's happened to you. It's, it's an unbelievable experience because it's entirely new. Yeah. And so you can live in this sort of fantasy world for m sometimes months, right? And lots of dopamine, lots of dopamine because <laughs> it's all new. Serotonin, it's whatever all, new. all those chemicals are. <laughs> and everybody around you will kind of put up with your silliness, right? Yes. So you can live in fantasy. People put up with it. Society puts up with it. And, and it's. It's really a magical time in life. It's also a very painful time in life too. Uh, it has its highs and its lows. So then you become an adult and you're, the context of your life gets larger and larger and larger. And you have, you fall in love. Well, you find it's a lot shorter. It's not months. It's a couple of weeks and then you're dating and life kind of creeps in. You start to immediately see the flaws in that other person and you adapt and maybe you get married and you move on with your life. Um, but notice that it's different. It's different because the fantasy part is not really allowable. Why? Because you can't blow off work to go on a date with your girl, mm -hmm. right? You can't because you have maybe a child bills, already yeah, from a previous bills. marriage and bills and responsibilities and a career and employees or whatever. So drinking, when in a drinking career, we have a tendency to hang on to the, the time when it was a blast and the fantasy stage. So every time we go into a binge, we, we, we try to hang on to that. We try to recreate it over and over and over, oh, and it never happens. Right. It never happens. But you, you get a nip of that in the first two or three drinks or two or three hits. And because you're going from sober to, to a different altered state in your body, and then you interpret that as pleasure. Oh, I'm going to get my fantasy. And then not really because I'm older and I know the truth. <laughs> All right. All right. The reality seeps in. But you hit it really hard in that fantasy stage, trying desperately to make it like it was when, when you were younger or a, a newly drinking or drugging person. And that's a, a futile effort. Yeah. We can't make reality budged. We can't push reality away the older we get. It's just reality. Well, that's it. Like when you're younger and every, all these experiences are brand new. So of course they're, everything's exciting and you, it's just the way life is. As you get older, everything is relative. And so as you get more broader experiences and you try different things, different things become important. Your preferences change and, and life becomes gets kind of settled and you have to work a little bit harder to find different things, to find things that you like. Yeah. You got to create uh, your new fantasies, your, but, but I think it's, it's a little more, it, the, the things that you decide upon as you grow, as the context of your life gets older is, uh, more meaningful. They tend yeah. to be more meaningful. You have to search out things that are larger or, or seek out experiences in the new generation. Your wisdom gets passed on to the previous, the, the next generation coming down the pike and that can become meaningful. The point is, is the simple act of drinking and drugging becomes mundane absolutely and, boring and but the problem is that the narrative that it is the all encompassing mystical most amazing addiction ever that narrative is playing in your mind and you're desperately trying to get that back and you're never gonna yeah and and the problem is so instead of telling people that it's not that their feelings that it's getting boring and mundane are correct and normal and normal. The treatment industry says the opposite. That's right. Okay. And, and this is not just the 12 step treatment industry. This is even alternatives. They're like, 
Yeah, it's bro- you know, it's kind of broken your dopamine receptors. So yeah, now you'll nothing never be, else is going to feel yes. as good. No, fucking age does that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. B- being bored does that. G- get off your ass and go do something. I-, I had to, I had to come to the reality that it was my job to be happy if I wanted to be happy. And I had to go out and make that happen. And, and that's why I tell people to swing the bat. That's it. Just, just try new experiences. There are infinite ways to spend your time and, and if you're somebody that's kind of getting into the monotony of life and maybe you're stuck in that rut. So every day is you get up, you go to work, you come home, you drink yourself or you drink or you smoke weed or whatever you do for the evening. And then you start all over again the next day and you're stuck in that rut. Well, when you come home from work today, go do something different. Yeah. You know, go for a walk, go shoot some pool, go swim at the Y, whatever it is. Literally go to Starbucks, have a coffee and start a conversation with a stranger. I mean, seriously, Um, because when we do this, when we start swinging the bat at life, doors will open. They do. And you realize, oh, that felt pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty awesome, actually. It you know, really I'm going to go do something different. That feels pretty good. <laughs> yeah. S- sitting in a eight by eight room, drinking a bottle of Jack all night, every day is gets pretty lame. You know, you know, but once in a while, it's probably pretty nice. That's the thing I figured out is, is when we, when we dig deep and we spend all of our, put all of our focus into one specific activity day in and day out. It becomes monotonous and boring. We start to feel depressed and anxious. And But when we challenge ourselves to go do something different, um, just to sh- kind of shake things up, you know, it, 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 it like awakens something in you. You know, it, that reminds me of a story. I remember reading an interview. David Lee Roth of Van Halen is, is he's hilarious. He's nuts. He's completely <laughs> self-centered. Like he is totally crazy. An egomaniac. Yeah, he is. But he's he's a hell of an entertainer. He's not even that good of a singer. He's just a great entertainer. He is a great entertainer. And and but he, they were doing an interview, and at that time, this is going back probably thirty years. And they said, you know, here you are. You're a martial arts expert. You're you're a kickboxer. You're a mountain climber. You do all this physical stuff, but you also smoke like three packs of ba- <laughs> Pall Malls a day. Drink Jack all day. You know, you're 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 this. And he said. To the, they said, why do you tear down everything that you work so hard? You know, you're, you're a very physical entertainer. And he said, well, the way I see it is I want some balance in my life. I love to, to live life in all its various ways. Yeah. And you look at a life like that. And some could argue, yeah, he's kind of a douche. He's getting, you know, he's always, <laughs> but, but he's a hell, he's brought something pretty magical to the world too. You know, yeah. and, and he's lived his life the way he wants to live it. And I've always admired that in people. Yes. They weren't afraid to try. And I said to myself one day when I was like 19 years old, I said, I'm going to change the treatment industry. And everybody, including my family, said, you're nuts. You're never going to be able to do I that. I said he was nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but I've lived my life the way I want to live it. Unapologetically. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think everybody should do that. Even if, if you say to yourself, you know what, uh, I want to live uh, my life sitting in front of the, the TV every night and smoke a cigarette and just live my life that way. Okay. 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 There was another story of a girl who she was 28 years old and she got terminal cancer. She died when she was 29 and she wrote a, oh, a, a, a two page thing. And she said, please know that you know, most people, when that's happening, they say they have these deep regrets about what they didn't do and all this kind of stuff. And she said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to accept people for who they are and let you know that you should accept yourself exactly as you are and then change whatever you want to change. But if you want to live a very calm life that doesn't accomplish much, but that's what you want to do, do it. Live that life because that's what you want. And she said, and then she goes, but if you want to live the life that's filled with all kinds of adventure, do that too. But neither path is right and or wrong. I'm sorry. Neither path is wrong. I was going to say, wrong. they're both right. Yeah. <laughs> neither path is wrong. And um, I think that that's, it's important to, to know those sorts of things, you yeah. know? Yeah. So this whole thing about addiction, 
you know, all of this research that's being done and they're going to keep doing it because the people funding the research have much to gain by showing that you're out of control and that what they want to sell you is a drug. Okay. Right. They want to sell you a treatment protocol, something that's outside of you that's going to go in and fix your addiction. It doesn't exist because right. it, your it'll mind, never exist. It'll never exist. Your mind is you and you're the one that interprets um, what's happening in your body and elsewhere and outside of you. And so if you, if you believe and and also is your beliefs. So if you believe that, that, you know, getting high is the best way to make you happy, then you're going to want to do it every day. Um, or maybe you're not, maybe you're going to want to do it once a week right. or that's the point, right? That's, you can, yeah. you can change. There is not something that's compelling you other than your own belief system. So if you think anything different than that, you need to read the freedom model, join the membership, get, get the online program, do whatever it takes to get the information so that you can debunk all the nonsense. Yeah. You know, that's keeping you trapped and believing that there's something wrong with you. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with you. You're not broken. Not at all. And even if you have all these other mental health diagnoses, they don't compel you to drink and drug. They don't. Um, people get over addiction, regardless of whether they have a mental health issue or not. Um, and they go, get, they get over it at very high rates. So, so just a reminder this Friday, April 1st, go to online.thefreedommodel.org. And for $39.95, you pay it. It's a monthly membership fee. You can have access to the, the full Freedom Model online program and all of the other membership uh, benefits benefits that you're going to get. So, so, so you're going to get the online program. You're going to get the five seminars on the history of AA and why you should never go. You're going to get the family online program. You're going to get a Q&A. Uh, with us, a private Q and a with Michelle once and a I month. once a month, you're the first get... one's going to be April 27th from three to 5 PM Eastern time. And then you'll get four, uh, additional short, uh, lessons, yep. from quick our, lessons each month from our instructors that are nationwide. You'll get a newsletter every month. You'll get the audio books. You'll get uh, the books themselves. You'll get the binge construct. You'll get life movements. Any new content that's added for as long as you're a member, um, we'll be adding like new modules to the Freedom Model online program. Um, we are going to be adding uh, lessons about each appendix um, yep. in the, within the next several months. So be, you can you'll have access to all of that. As well. That's a good point too. You also get the workbook. Yeah, and um, the workbook. Yep. So that which so, I just revised. Yeah, um, I just did the fifth revision on that. So the new workbook will be uploaded in the online program, uh, probably by the end of by April first. So that's a lot. It's a lot. We are working hard <laughs> to help you to find true freedom from whatever addiction you're struggling with. So it also we're doing this so that you're not alone. Yeah, you're so not as, alone as you deprogram which takes a little bit of time sometimes it does. Um, you, you're with us, you yeah. know, and you're with others that are, that are also doing that. Yeah. It took us a long time to, to compile all of this information and just figure three this decades. all out. Just, <laughs> you know, because we were immersed in the system too. Yeah, we were and, deeply, um, deeply. deeply immersed in the system. And I, we went down that path looking for all of these outside external causes. And yeah. we went down the path trying to figure out external means to fix us ourselves yep. and to fix other people. And it, it, it doesn't work. All you need is information, the right information. That's right. Okay. So thanks everyone. And, um, go check out the, the Freedom Model International membership. Bye.